panelists for tonight's event, uh, one of whom is, uh, I think, outside of the room at the moment, so I'll introduce him last. Um, joining us tonight are uh, three folks with uh, varying points of view on tonight's film. Um, going alphabetically, our first uh, panelist tonight is Arajit Basu. Uh, he's a final year doctoral student uh, who is now ABD, which means everything but the dissertation, uh, in the College of Media and Communication at Texas Tech. Uh, he is a former advertising executive from Mumbai, also known as uh, Bombay, where he has worked with some of the leading global ad agencies, ad agencies such as Ogilvy, uh, Publicis, Publicis. Publicis uh, Low, etc. Uh, his research interests in the PhD program are cross-cultural cross branding strategies, uh, cultural identity and persuasion, cultural consequences of marketing communications. Uh, he's also interested in world cinema, thus his uh, visit here with us tonight, uh, music and travel. So welcome to uh, Ari for his first time here. Uh, next is uh, Joby Martinez. Joby is the director of the Cross-Cultural Academic Advancement Center here on campus. Uh, with, which is um, a unit that um, helps uh, program and promote a number of different initiatives around the campus, some of which are very visible for students such as Holi and El Grito, uh, but others of which are less visible to students and more visible perhaps to faculty. Um, just a couple days ago, the Cross-Cultural Academic Advancement Center hosted the Asian and Asian American Identity Colloquium, a one-day conference here on campus. Uh, they've hosted a diversity summit in the last couple of years, the Difficult Dialogue Seminar that perhaps you may have seen posters for around campus, the Open Teaching Concept that was originated uh, last year and we're bringing back again this year, um, and also the uh, Connecting Diversity to Teaching and Learning Committee, which is a group of faculty here on campus that are uh, sort of affiliated with the Cross-Cultural Academic Advancement Center. Uh, so Joby oversees all of these programs and is a real champion here on campus for uh, diversity, equity, and community engagement. Um, and by the way, the Cross-Cultural Academic Advancement Center also sponsors Global Lens, which we are very thankful for. Finally, Dr. Uh, Jimmy Reeves, who is in the building somewhere, um, I'm sure he'll come in here in a few minutes, uh, is uh, Associate Professor in the College of Media and Communication. Uh, he teaches visual communication, intro, uh, introduction to electronic media, broadcast programming and promotions, analyzing television and writing for series television. Uh, and his research focuses on media and film criticism and history with an emphasis on uh, television and film analysis, as well as uh, video gaming uh, and the, uh, what he calls the media playground. Um, so since Dr. Reeves is uh, forthcoming here. I guess I will allow Ari to go first with his uh, sort of uh, reflections on the film and then um, we'll turn, turn it over to Joby and then we'll see what happens from there. Right. Well, thank you Dr. Beasley. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. This is my first time and uh, uh, it's, it's funny because this movie brought back some really weird memories for me because I've been to, my forefathers actually hail from this city but I grew up in Mumbai, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, the financial capital and also the place where uh, we have Bollywood, the famous uh, singing and dancing and the sanitized and glossy version of Indian cinema. So I come from that school and uh, this is uh, Kolkata, the city that was uh, featured in this film, is kind of, uh, was considered to be the cultural capital of India, which as you can see has fallen into a great state of dis this disrepair and the one and only time I went there was I think in the early 2000s and I could not wait to get out of there it was so slow and I was really uh, and I went for a wedding and I just couldn't like handle the pace of the place as you can see it's so slow um, and uh, that kind of like resonated with me when I watched the film and uh, for those of you all who saw the beginning shots the establishing shots as they say where they showed the houses and the lanes. Um, it just shows you how the city has fallen into a state of dis disrepair. And uh, uh, the political background of this city is like um, the party that rules the state is the Communist Party of India. So they're uh, the, red, the red state, so to speak, and the rest of the country is democratic. So you can see the change. The rest of the country has progressed a lot, but Calcutta, is still very much stuck in a time warp. 
So that's another thing that you know really uh, st stands out to me when I watched the film. And I think it's, uh, uh, it was interesting to see how the older generation is still uh, looking out for the city and the people there, whereas the people of our age and a little older than us have kind of like settled into complacency and just having this idea that, you know, life goes on, it's not really our problem, so why should we care? So those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Um, I was actually watching the film while I was working, and so I was on my computer, and the one thing that stood out for me was when the gentleman was speaking to the government official, his very first complaints, and he said, so you're telling me the whole system has to change before you can turn off the lights. And for some reason, I guess maybe in the frame of mind that I was in, I just thought of the tech shuffle. How many of you have heard of the tech shuffle and sort of where students have an issue and they're directed from one office and then to the next office and then maybe to the next office. Well, you don't have everything complete here, so you have to go to this office. And so as the film went on, that pen became very symbolic. And I just sort of started, and, and it might be my background because I've worked in financial aid. I've done academic advising. I've been at the forefront with students and talking to them that I, that I thought the pen became very symbolic in that you need this pen just to get something done and sort of um, maybe not today because of technology but back when I worked with other students back in the 90s it was you needed that registration card like you had to actually fill out a card to go to classes or to register for classes and you needed to go from one office to the next to the next and it was three hour lines four hour lines um, just to get that done and so when I thought about that, I, it just sort of, my mind went to systems and how systems work and how, how cultures work. Um, and and it, that, that's the first thing that I sort of reflected on. A couple of other things that I noticed was sort of the gender of the film and that you, very, you didn't really see the women too visible in the film. You saw the servant at the beginning and she was, she was asking to get paid. She needed to get paid. But she came in in sort of this very nagging, like, you need to pay me. Um, and then you saw the wife later on, and she was just rambling, or what you would consider rambling, but she's <coughs> making conversation. Uh, she's talking about the bills, she's talking about needing more money for her cell phone, she wants to talk to their grandkids. But then throughout the rest of the film, like if you saw the bus scene and if you saw other scenes, you saw maybe one woman, maybe two women on the bus. Um, and then when they were the, the main character of the film, when he was sitting down in sort of that alley in the evening and just talking to his people he knows and his friends again it was men it was the older men and they were talking about you know what's going on here what's the problems of society um, and I know I know some of the history and some of the current standings of India but that's that's sort of what stuck out to me was just sort of the gender and but I also reflected a little bit because when I'm on my computer too I'm also on Facebook and I I have students on my Facebook and I have my personal Facebook but as I thought about what this gentleman was doing every time he was out in the street like do you know where the lights are on do you know why the lights are on? And then sort of when he won, sort of won that battle in the end, like, hey, I've I had to go through this horrible system, but now I'm dancing in the street. It sort of reminded me of sort of the Facebook um, phenomenon, for lack of a better word right now, so that I know when students have a problem or even when I have a problem, like if I'm mad about something, I'm going to post. Like, I can't believe so-and-so did this. Um, but you hope to congregate like a mass of people to sort of buy into what you're upset about or what you're happy about. And so that's what I was thinking as he was going down the street. Like, he's trying to convince other people that, hey, this is a problem, this is an issue. Um, and then finally, when you get that satisfaction, you know, he's dancing in the street, but we use other sort of social media uh, opportunities to, to say, hey, we won or we did this. And you kind of see, see it going on. Um, the best example I can give is, is Coach Kingsbury, um, you know, that whole media frenzy and social media frenzy that went on like our problems are solved we have a new coach and he's an alumni and so those are some of the reflections that I had as I was uh, watching this film a little bit more relevant I think to students because I was in that mode but more so for me what stuck out was and what I equated it with was that text shuffle just the shuffle of resources um, you can't find the right thing so I'm going to push you to another place or I'm going to push you to another place and just especially when he went to that office where they were just all talking about vacation and he's just standing there like is anyone going to pay attention to me having worked in a financial aid office before I've sort of seen that um, or heard that students uh, are not happy with sort of what they see in the back uh, but those were just some of my reflections I think your, your comment on gender is really interesting because the he uh, 
Shia Mo, uh, becomes sort of that same faceless, uh, unresponsive bureaucracy to the two, you know, women that have speaking roles in the, mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the film. Mm, yeah, that's true. You know, they're, they're coming to him with complaints or with requests. That's or, true. That's right. I hadn't uh, thought he's, that. He's yes. basically silent. And that's true. Huh. That. Yeah. So I guess it replicates, right? If we're abused, we pass on that abuse to those who are disempowered compared to us. Mm. Uh, any other comments, questions for our panelists? Anna Hazari is uh, this, um, he's of the same age as the protagonist in the movie. He's around 80 years old and he's a freedom fighter. He fought in, uh, for India's independence and he's highly regarded as uh, Gandhian. Um, uh, he practices nonviolence and his, uh, he came in the limelight recently because of some uh, incidents in the, regarding corruption in India last year and he went on a fast uh, till death. So, uh, till this issue was not resolved. And just similarly uh, to the character in the movie, uh, he, this fast resulted in a law being passed, uh, which was an anti-corruption bill, which had never happened before. So that's why he's, uh, he, they probably mentioned him in the movie. Um, <laughs> Edison's <laughs> got answer that. Um, no, it's it's always been like that. I mean, right from my grandfather's house, it's always been in English. I think it's because we uh, were a British colony, so that was probably why. It's my first guess. Well, isn't it? Uh, isn't a lot of the Indian bureaucracy sort of a relic of British colonialism? Absolutely, and the buildings you saw in the movie, they're all like old colonial structures, which are you know, kind of crumbling right now, so, yeah. Does that answer your question? How many of you have ever been to Holy, the event that happens on campus? Have any of you been to that event? One, just one. Can you tell us about it? Do you mind sharing? So you throw powder at each other is basically what it is. If you've seen us on the news, or if you saw the color run, um, I think the color run is sort of, um, I think the idea was stolen from Holi, because <laughs> Holi's funny. been around for many, many years. Um, but Holi is a festival of colors, and I think that it's significant. And the reason we brought it to the campus is because of what it, and, and Ari, if you'll help me with this a little bit, of what it, it demonstrates is that it is, a, it is a festival based on Hindu mythology, but out, it's also out of India and South Asia um, in that it's a time when caste systems are supposed to brought, be brought down and communities are supposed to come together. And I think that if you look at the film and if you heard some of what Ari's uh, reflections were, is that there are caste systems there, there's that bureaucracy, there are communities that don't really come together. Um, and you saw the gentleman sort of struggling to talk to, you know, it was okay when he talked to the neighbors, but as he went and talked to others, it was a bit of a challenge. And so that's why we brought it to the campus, although the campus it reflects more sort of contemporary U.S., but it's, it's, it's a festival based out of India for that opportunity for the, for the different um, caste, for the caste systems, I guess, to not be minded that day, for, for categories of people not to be minded that day. And, it, and so basically, the, the, the relevance of the powder is once you have, you're covered in powder, you all look the same. And so those, those things that did sort of separate you don't quite matter on that particular day, and so that's why we bring it to campus. But it's based off of, uh, it's based out of uh, India and South Asia, and, and I think that's what I also reflected on as I was watching the film because you definitely see those systems, and you you do see the sort of the poverty. And just as Ari mentioned, there's a poverty in that particular city, while the rest other cities are flourishing around it, um, and so there are issues to be examined as to why that is. Ari, but could, thank you. Could you could you speak to caste? what that means and to, 
what extent does it still operate? Well, that's a <laughs> whole another lecture. But uh, really, it's uh, I think for the most part, people our age, like our generation, has doesn't really consider it important anymore. I think that's the important thing. Earlier on, it kind of got distorted in the way it was originally supposed to be, uh, where it was just like the whole uh, idea of uh, there's the religious scholar who's a Brahmin, and then there was the warrior who was the Kshatriya, which is what my forefathers come from, and then there was the merchant who are the Patels, like most of you all know the Patels. Uh, they come from the merchant community, and there's another community which is like the menial worker, the labor class. So it kind of was separate into that, and they would not really, they would have their own separate roles. So um, the, the priest did all the priestly work, and the other communities did the other work, and it kind of stayed that way for the longest time. But us and when people are, you know, the generations kept changing, and uh, things started uh, changing, uh, those kind of class barriers have broken down pretty much. Except if you go into like the smallest or the most, conservative, if you go to the Indian South, it's very much like the American South is what I tell people here. <laughs> the sudden you go, the more conservative it gets. And uh, uh, those rules are kind of like breaking down now because of globalization and you know, uh, multinationals and people going abroad and coming back with those ideas and sharing those. So for the most part, like our generation doesn't believe in that anymore. Well, I think from watching the movie, you could make out the dialogue was interspersed with words in English. And uh, the city is actually considered to be a literary and uh, cultural capital. And there's a lot of intellectuals who come from that city in terms of music, poetry. We had uh, Ray, who's like an Oscar winning director. Uh, we had Tagore, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. So this city is known for that kind of bringing that intellectual capital to the country. And uh, you could make out, by the way he was speaking, that he kind of considers himself to middle class, uh, but the house, I mean, it's really in shambles, but most of the, you know, the old houses in Calcutta, like my grandparents' and their relatives' houses are very much like this. They're sprawling, they're huge. They have like three or four floors and everything, but they're all like crumbling and broken down. So, and the, we're very much like middle class, I would, I would say. So yes, I would, uh, I would think that from his mannerisms, he appears to be middle class.